And uh, that's what this passage was all about this morning, being changed. And, and that reminds me of a story I heard about two prawns that were in the sea, swimming about, enjoying themselves. But there's only one problem. They just had to be careful with the sharks that were in the water. And so, you know, they were getting a bit fed up, and, and, and Justin was the name of one, one of the prawns, and Christian the name of the other. And, and Justin was saying to Christian, you know, I'm really fed up, I'm getting really sad here. We're always swimming away from these sharks. Wouldn't it be great, you know, if a wish could come true and I could become a shark, and then I wouldn't be so frightened and have to swim away. And just then a mysterious cod uh, swam up and uh, says, I will grant you this wish. And so Justin got turned into a shark. And immediately Christian swam away. And all of his friends all swam away. They were really frightened now of Justin being able to become the shark. And it wasn't very long after that that uh, Justin the shark started to feel lonely again and depressed again. And, and, and how he imagined being a shark wasn't quite the same and he was missing his friends. And uh, he was getting really sad within himself. And, and, and then he started to regret. And he went and he found the cod again. And he says, Look, please, please turn me back. Please turn me back into a prawn again. Please, please, I, I really regret this. I'm having a sad life. And so the, the cod turned around and turned him back into a prawn. And he was so excited. He was throwing a party. He wanted to throw a cocktail party for everyone. He went back and he seen his friends. And, it, and he was having a really great time with all his friends. But the only thing was Christian wasn't there. And so he was asking, well, where's Christian, my friend? I really missed him. He says, well, he was so depressed ever since he became a shark that he just locked himself up at home. And so uh, Justin turned around and, and he, he started to swim after, right through, right up to the coral gates of where his friend Christian lived. He started knocking on the, on the door and he, he says, it's me, it's me, come out and play with me, come out and play with me. And, and Christian said, no, no, I know you're only trying to trick me, you're a shark. And I'm not coming out so you can eat me for your dinner. And, uh, and just as said, no, that was the old me. I've changed, I've found God, I'm a cross again Christian. <laughs> You see, as a pastor here, I'm very aware that Jesus taught updates. And the reason he taught updates was he wanted people to change. And the reason he wanted people to change was so that they could progress in life. Yeah? And we've got to be careful how we change and what we ask to change into. And so that's where this passage comes into. Because we are to be changed, but it's with the yeast of God, which we're going to look at in a few moments or so. And, and uh, even Jesus had problems changing. He was stigmatized. Jesus came from a dysfunctional family. Yeah? Uh, uh, when, when, when his mother became pregnant, she had to run away and hide. Yeah? And, and then he was, he was born out of wedlock. Yeah? And, and he wasn't born with a normal birth. Very dysfunctional. And instead of getting a room somewhere, as we know, they didn't want him in the inn and they thrown him out into the stable. There's mom and dad that have baby Jesus there in a stable with all the dirty, filthy animals. They, that was totally dysfunctional. And then they had to go and hide for a couple of years later. And as we read the Bible, we find out that lots of people hated Jesus, hated his family. And then there even comes a point when his own family hated him, when he was teaching and preaching. They came and tried to drag him out of the house. They, and, and everyone's saying he's got a demon. Uh, he's not one of us. You know, he's totally out there. A way out there off the map of what everybody expected Jesus to be. He wasn't normal. He was completely dysfunctional. And so even whenever, you know, he got the call of God upon his life, yeah, and he went and he preached his first sermon, and he went to his hometown, Nazareth, and he stood up, and he read from the prophet Isaiah, and he says, you know, I've come with good news to proclaim to you. You know, I've come to set the prisoners free. Uh, this is the Jubilee year. 
debt cancellation. I've come to change your lives. And you would have thought that they would have been amazed and excited and happy and just like us this morning. And they would have went, yeah, brilliant, we've been waiting for this. We've sung about it in churches. We've, we've read about it in the scrolls. We've, we've talked about it. We've prophesied over it. We've prayed for it. And here he is coming to set us free. But they were so stuck with their religion and the way things was, their status quo, that when he actually came, they were so confined to the boundaries of the prison of their lives that they weren't willing to break free out of those boundaries because they were so conditioned. And they got so used of the way it's always been. Prison isn't necessarily a place with prison bars on it and barbed wire fence. A prison is in your mind. A prison can be spiritually, where Jesus wanted to break them free spiritually, but he also wanted to break them free physically as well. You know, get out of Nazareth. There's a big world out there. What are you doing in this small little town that nobody knows about, nobody cares about, nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth? You know, a prophet is not without worthy, uh, without honor, except in his own town. Yeah, and it's true for all of us. As soon as you become a Christian, you start to break free from the limiting life controlling, limiting thoughts that you have in your mind. As soon as you break free and you say, I've got a vision, I've got a plan, you know, a purpose from God, it's a good plan. God's going to give me this great future. As soon as you tell your friends that, I bet your family and your hometown will start to ridicule you. We know this guy. We know what he's like. He's not to be trusted. We know his mom and his dad and his families and his brothers. How can he say that consolation? And you see, Jesus was trying to explain to them something from the heart. He was breaking them free in grace and in mercy from their heart. But they weren't prepared to be broken free. And Jesus was trying to say to them, you don't have to wait seven years to death cancellation. You can have death cancellation every single moment, every day of your life. Because Jesus can set you free from all sins and all debts within your life, both spiritually and physically. Because when you start to get the wisdom of God, then you start to realize you don't need credit cards. Yeah? You don't need all this debt from the bank. But when Jesus was speaking, I presume there was people there that, that, that were bankers. And they owned the credit card companies and, and the Wonga.coms of this uh, society. They owned them. And so, of course, they got the people to persecute Jesus. So how did Jesus get on with his first sermon? He got stoned nearly to death. They wanted to kill him and stone him and persecute him because he came to liberate. And what happened to Jesus? His own received him not. He came on to his own. They received him not. So he went from Nazareth down to Capernaum. When he got down into Capernaum, they didn't know him. And, and he stood up and preached the same messages there in Capernaum. And they said, oh, brilliant stand in Ophasian. Come and stay with us. We love this guy. Who is this guy? He's bringing the same message that he preached in his hometown. He now preached here in, in Capernaum. And they actually, actually loved him and they wanted him to stay. And he made his home in Capernaum. And then Jesus was amazing, he was always changing, and, and, and as he was walking along the roads, he, he wasn't conforming to the religious laws of that day, he was breaking them all, he was thinking out of the box, he was off the map, he was doing things that they'd never heard before, seen before, and, and he comes to a tree and there's a tax collector up the tree, and uh, I love it because this tax collector was hated even more than Jesus, and that's something. You know, this tax collector up a tree, and Jesus turned around and says, Come down, Zacchaeus, come down, because I'm going to have a meal with you. Thinking outside the box. And I'm sure all the religious leaders were all standing there, if you read the story, and they were saying, Hold on a minute, you can't go and have a meal with this unclean person. This tax collector is the enemy. How can you love the enemy? Yeah, and, and, and Jesus called them down, and they were actually hoping. Like a lot of people do in churches for the pastor, hoping that the pastor will say, uh, I can't come to your house for tea today because you've got to change the way you are. I can't be seen messing about with you and having a meal with you and accepting you into God's love and God's kingdom because we're out to change people first. And that's been a, a bad thing in the church. 
Because in this passage, when you read this, these few verses, you will realize that we are not the yeast, we are the dough. And the baker is God. And, and within church, you know, we, we are like fish in church, but we're like the sharks in fish in church. And instead of going out and, and, and catching fishers of men, the people out there in church, there's some bad fish in here. Not in this church particularly, but in all churches, you get sharks, you get eels, they're slimy, they'll bite you, they're not nice when you catch a shark and an eel, and they're smelly, and they're jumping all over the place. And it's really hard uh, in church, and this is the reason why a lot of people don't actually want to come into church, because they've heard about the reputation of a lot of churches, and they've heard that it's not a happy place, it's not a nice place, it's judgmental. And this is what Jesus was trying to break you free from, break me free from, break the whole lot of us totally free from. And the church has got it wrong. The church thought that it was the yeast, and it was its job, and your job, to change people. It is not our job to change people. It's the yeast that changes our lives and changes the lives of people within the community. If we look at church history, we can easily see the problem. Whenever uh, the church first of all started to get persecuted, and 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 and, and the word, you know, and, and the Bible says there were singleness of heart and gladness of heart. They went about breaking bread with this joy in their lives, singleness and, and joy of the Lord in their hearts, and this gladness. And they were persecuted. And they were persecuted on, on their Nero and, and, and other emperors. And, and they were really persecuted really, really badly. And, and God blessed them through persecution. And you know, you know when that yeast goes into the dough? And remember the dough is made up of, of flour and wheat. We are the wheat, not the weeds. And it's made up of water. We've got the water of the word and the water through baptism. Um, and we are to be the salt in the world. And so we're made up of, of flour. We become the flour and the dough. And you know, it, it gets beaten. And you know, God, like this woman in this parable, beats the dough and she adds yeast into the dough. And, and, and it mixes and it permeates. And you cannot separate that yeast from the dough once that yeast is in the dough. And it totally permeates and, and it... it, it affects everything. It's now turning into bread with yeast in it. And that makes it rise. And we've got to rise. And that's what the early church did. They rose above the persecutions, the struggles, the hardships, everything that was going on in church. They rose above it because they had the yeast of the Word of God in their lives. They had the grace of God, the yeast of the grace of God in their lives. The yeast of the Holy Spirit. And more importantly, they had Jesus Himself living in their lives and he was the yeast that changed them and as they became changed then they would change, they changed Rome and, and when Constantine came in power in Rome we know that he turned to Christianity and then Christianity became the empire of Rome and eventually the world the known world at that time but it wasn't so long after that that the church forgets that it's the dough it's not the yeast and what happens in the early church is absolutely terrible because you've got all the persecution through the crusades of the early church where they forget that they're not the yeast. But they forget this and they go out and they try to beat people into Christianity. And, and, and then we get the horrific things that happened in the name of Christ in the early church for centuries. They went out and they tried to change people and they became the persecutors. Did the church? The church became the persecutors now and they forgot that they are not the persecutors. They are the persecuted and they are to grow. And so this happens continually and, uh, through church history, right through until we started to get revival again in this country. And, and people like John Wesley came and he taught about the heart transformation again and it's the heart within the holiness movement started up which we are a part of the holiness, holiness uh, mission. The holy, 
the holiness mission of God is really, really good. It's one of the best things that, that can actually happen to you. If you can understand, you know, George Sharp, uh, one of the earlier founders here of the Church of the Nazarene, who had this holiness movement. Holiness is having that yeast in your heart. It's no big deal. It's not complicated. We complicate it. We make rules and regulations up. And we interpret what holiness is. And there you've got the problem. Because Jesus never gave us all these rules and regulations. Where did they come from? The church starts to add the rules and the regulations into it. And so therefore, we don't think children, when they come into sh church, should be running around in church. They should be seen and not heard, is a rule. And they should be quiet in church. Because this is holy ground. Well, I've got news for you, this is holy ground. The holy ground is in your heart. Your heart is the holy ground. That's where the transformation takes place. Not in the church. And then the kids, when they grow up in church, they turn into teenagers. And, uh, and, and you know, if you go back through church history, what you'll find is for the first Bible was written on stone. And it was tapped out, or it was written with the finger of God. And then Moses had to redo it in stone. And then after the stone came the parchments and the scrolls. And then, you know, they used to come to church with scrolls. And then we got the Bible, eventually. And, and teenagers, you know, they've got smartphones now and iPad. You know, they don't know what a Bible is. One of those things. You know, they don't know what a Bible is. Now, it's like the Hobbit. You know, from the Shire, when they come out with the Bible. Um, and and teen with the lot of teenagers to find the Word of God on their smartphones. You can get every translation on a smartphone, an iPod. You can get it all. It's all there. It's the, but sometimes in churches, we have this rule that they can't be on smartphones. They can't be on iPods. And they've got to do things without the technology. And these are all our rules. These are our rules, not God's. We've got, you know, teenagers are smart. And if we can get them into church, we can listen to teenagers and the children, the 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds. And when they see, and we're cool with that. We understand where they're coming from. And when we're cool with that, then they will continue to come into this church. And we will get them back. Because a lot of teenagers have lost, you know, the church has lost thousands upon thousands of teenagers. And because the church couldn't accept change, you know, and, and, and teenagers do dress differently, we've got a dress code, where did that come from, this dress code, I know the Bible says we have to have modest apparel, yeah, but then we interpret it in our way, what is modest apparel, and, uh, and some of these holy people of God, holiness people of God, good people, they got, so, so they started to buy their clothes from the charity shop, and you know, and, and when you look at it, you can actually tell, you know, it's not even good stuff. Some of them what they've been wearing, it's charity stuff. And when you look at them, you can say, that's definitely Fred Burr. And not only is that Fred Burr, but I've been hearing about some of the carpets that we give to the pastors are Fred Burr carpets. When we get a new one, we pass our Fred Burr over to the pastor because he's a holiness God. He doesn't matter. And we got all these rules and all these regulations. And, and, and where's it come from? Where's the interpretations coming from? Not from Jesus. It's our interpretation, what we put on it. And so we get rid of all our pop music, you know, and we burn them and break them up. And we cover up the TV and 50 years ago, the pastor's coming, holiness God, man of God. You know, and they cover it up and, and they say, that's the budget. <laughs> <laughs> And, and with all these rules and regulations, and what it's doing is, it's scaring people from the church, the teenagers, all scaring the, the, the people with families around the area, not just here, but lots of churches, because with all these silly rules and regulations. Now, if we had this gladness of heart, and if we had, if, if we had the patience and the love and the grace of God in our hearts, and if we seen people who they can become, and stop trying to change them. And let God be the yeast. Let God change them. You know, when, when Jesus took Zacchaeus down off that tree and went to his house, he didn't order him to give fourfold back of what he robbed the people and the commission that he put on all this credit to people. You know, Jesus never said that. We don't read it in the Bible. 
But the yeast of the gospel of who Christ was came across to the guy, and then the guy of his own free will and from his heart said, you know what, I want what you've got. I want the yeast of God in my life, and I want to start to give back to people and to help people, and, and I want to be the person that God wants me to be. And so he changed by being in the presence of someone who has had the yeast within their lives. So we've got to question things in life. Who said this? Who said it? You know, who said that we are what we are? And, and, and we have to be and behave the way we are. When Jesus came, he gave us constant updates within the Bible. He came and he talked about in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. And that was totally different because he was saying, you know, it has been said and you have heard. But I say to you, you know, if somebody doesn't have a coat, you've got to give them another coat. Give them your coat. You, don't, you can't wear two coats at the same time. If somebody asks you to go a mile, then go two miles with the person, and, and he was talking about grace and mercy from the heart. There's no way you can live it. There's no way you can live the Beatitudes without the grace and the mercy and the transforming yeast happening within your life. It has to happen inside you. And as it happens inside, you become the great person that God wants you to be. You become unlocked from within. You start to get a hold of the vision and the plan that God has for your life, and that moves you forward. And that keeps you going forward. God has a vision for you, but you've got to get the vision that God has for you. God has a plan for you. He's got a purpose for you. He's got an absolutely great life for you. But what you've got to do is unlock it through the yeast of God's Word. You've got to pray about it. And you've got to apply the Bible into your life. And then that yeast helps you to rise above situations. I used to be a violent person. Not violent no more. I rise above it. The yeast rises me above it. I used to be angry. I used to have a foul mouth. I was a criminal. I was uneducated in a bad sense. And, and I did everything wrong in society. But when the yeast enters my heart, I can rise above it. And that's what Jesus was telling people. You know, go out into all the world. Go out into all the world and preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Be the yeast in the world. We preach this good news of transformation that God has done in our lives. When people see the transformation, the grace is on our life. Yes, we, you know, a lot of times we're in our right to be angry. We're in our right to judge people. You know, we've got a right to defend ourselves. Yeah, we've got all these rights. But when people see something in you genuinely, that you know, I understand. Yeah, I could be angry. You know, I could smack you around the back of the head. You know, I could smack you on the legs. You know, we have children. You know, you can't do it nowadays because you get arrested <laughs> if, if you try to smack your children. I got smacked. Didn't do me anymore. Yeah. Uh, but they were in the good old days. But we've changed. We've changed now. You have to be careful what you do uh, within church and around people. But when people see that change in our lives, Look, oh, wow, he's a really nice person, or she's a really nice person. You see, the yeast can transform you whether you're a woman or a man. So Jesus came and he empowered women. And he empowered the first woman he empowered, became the first evangelist in the Bible, the Good Samaritan. Uh, not the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan woman. Everybody rejected, we know the story well. He didn't criticize her around the well. He didn't change her around the well. He didn't say you're wearing too much makeup. Your skirt's a bit short. And, and we've got to get rid of them high heel shoes that you're wearing. The dress code. None of that came into it. He just told her and spoke into her heart. And she agreed with what he was saying. And she went back and transformed through the yeast that Jesus had put into her heart. Her innermost being. You see, we have to be the living water. Living water comes from the inside of each one of us. We are to be the salt and the light. We shake our heads, and it's good to shake our heads, but it has to go from the head into the heart. You have to apply it. And there's too many people in churches shaking their heads. Yeah, and then during the week, it's all gone. 
It's all gone when they leave the church. And it's my job not to be just inspiring this morning and really inspiring you. It's my job to keep inspiring you every single week and keep, in, and keep putting that yeast into your life so that it's not just a one-off sermon. Ah, oh, the yeast, inspiration, we can forget about that. Because I check up on you. <laughs> I won't let you do it because I'm not wasting my time up here. Yeah? If this is Nazareth, yeah, I've got Capernaum to go to. Yeah? Where I get a stand in Ovasian. Maybe like Jesus when he went there and people really love this message. So this is my Nazareth here with you guys. And I'm here with you and I want you to grow and to be the felt and the people that God wants you to be. So that you can apply this from your heart and not just shake your head head knowledge, there's too many, and it's good to shake your head, I get that, I shake my head, but we have to apply it into our life. You know, I mentioned the Good Samaritan there, well we know Jesus is the Good Samaritan in that story, and he comes along and he sees somebody beaten, beaten half dead, somebody useless, and you know, he, he wasn't concerned about himself, he stopped and helped that person. And he helped that person and he rose above with the yeast in his life. He rose above the circumstances surrounding that situation. Too many of us are crossing on the other side of people in this community. Too many of us aren't rising above the situation here within this community. We've got to stop. We've got to start helping people and be the yeast into their lives. If every day we get up and say, God, help me to be the yeast. I'm going to be the yeast here. I'm not going to be the dough and the flour. I'm not going to beat people up. That's a process that God does. It's a process to get that yeast in and through so that you become the dough that God wants you to become in this parable. Don't, don't, don't think God's being too hard on you if you're going through struggles today, hardships and persecution. There's a reason for that. That's the process so that God can make you the person that he wants you to really be. Don't bite God, don't fight God. And, and, and you know if you apply it into your life, what I have found and what many other people have found in life is as soon as you apply it into your life, the persecutions will probably stop. Because God says you've passed that test. You've passed that test, you haven't reacted the way you've always reacted. You're a stronger person from within your heart. And so the process continues until you become this lovely dough. The joy and the happiness and the peace and the contentment in any situation and in any circumstances. That's the journey of holiness that I am on. That's the journey of holiness that each one of us is on here today. It's the apply the Beatitudes. What are you? Who are you? How is God changing you this morning? Is he, just, is he adding yeast into your life and you're finding it instead of allowing him to change you from within so that he, he, he has a great life for you? You can influence people in this community and your family just like Jesus did. Each one of us have great gifts, but we need the character as well as the gifts. I've always said I'm not the greatest preacher in this church. <laughs> And nobody says, argues with me about it. <laughs> and that's really sad. And, and, and whenever I say, whenever I say, you, you know I'm really stupid, nobody argues with me. And I'm an idiot. They'll go, yeah, yeah. You know. Maybe he's getting a bit of wisdom now. He realizes that. We all knew that anyway. Yeah. But as soon as you get the character, as soon as you get the character, then your gifts will take you with the character, with the graces of God. But you've got to change. And the change happens with each one of us and from in us. And we become the people of influence in a sad world. We become a, a, a people that, that accepts people. Yeah? And we apply this grace and mercy into our lives and it permeates us into the people of this community. Amen? Amen.